let's all stand together tonight and get ready to worship. Father, we thank you for another opportunity to come into your house. It's been a good day. Of course, it should have been because you're a good God and you always give good things to your people. So we just accept them. And tonight, God, we're going to worship you. We're going to lift your name up in song. We're going to start from the very beginning, just letting you know just how much we love you and how much we thank you for life for liberty. We thank you, God, for freedom of worship. And we ask you to bless us all tonight. Keep us safe and keep us strong. And God, now we just give you everything we have and let you know from the bottom of our hearts, we sure do love you and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. It's coming back for us. Amen. <clears throat> had just a little talk with Jesus today. Amen. We all have, I hope. <laughs> it's his day. Mr. Ernest, if you're out there listening, I'm sure going to miss you on this song tonight, but we're going to let Daddy see if he can do it justice. How about that? <laughs> just a little talk with Jesus. <clears throat> Oh 
sing it is well with my soul how many of you this week have had the peace of God to be able to just to say I don't care what's going on out there but it is well in my soul I've sung this song all week long and it has been my saving grace something that I hold on to and when the world around me wants to tell me all the negativity I just go that's all right it is well with my soul amen <clears throat>
Father, we thank you tonight that we can sing that it's well with our soul and that we can sing that song from our soul. All is well. Everything's good between me and you, God. My sins are forgiven. I'm in love with you. You're my father. I'm your son. All is well. And one day, heaven will be mine. Father, we thank you for that hope, for that privilege. We pray tonight, Lord, for all of our sick and all of our hurting. Now, Lord, you'll minister now. Reach out to the hospitals and the nursing homes and at homes where people are not well and bring them well. Touch their bodies. Strengthen them, God. Let them feel your power and know that someone is praying that knows how to get a hold of the throne of God. I pray for the entire nation, Lord. We pray for this coronavirus, that, Lord, you'll stop it, that it will cease where it is, and that, God, you'll begin to make whole and make well all those people that have been affected in any way, and, God, those who are safe, that you keep them safe. We just thank you for all the miracles you've done, all the greatness of God, all the beauty of God. We thank you for it. And God, now we're going to study your word. We're going to open up the word and we're going to let the word speak to us. So God, fill our hearts. And we just remind you, we sure do love you and thank you for this privilege. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, I'm glad tonight that you're back and that we're going to worship to God together again. Those of you who are watching live stream, we certainly welcome you and want you to know we miss you. I miss seeing you here. I don't like to have to preach to empty pews. So I miss you. Hope you miss us. And want you just to rejoice tonight and worship with us right there where you are. Get your Bibles out and turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to look at a couple of verses there tonight before we begin into the service. I want to encourage you to continue to pray this week for one another. Pray for those who are sick and hurting in any way. If you're not, thank God for it and ask him to continue to keep you safe. Pray, pray for the entire world for God to reach out and touch all the people and bring healing to their bodies. In Ephesians chapter 1, beginning with verse 15, it says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Father, we thank you for the word and we pray that this word will inspire us also to pray one for another. Pray for wisdom for one another, that we may know you, that we may know your word, that we may understand you and know what to do and how to do it and when to do it in the troubled times that we're living in. God, keep your hand upon us. Help us now as we hear this word. Open our understanding that we may know what thus saith the Lord and let us be better because of it. And we pray all of this. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen and amen. Another translation of those verses says it this way. I always remember you in my prayers, and I thank God for you. I've done this ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people. I always pray to the great and glorious God, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that he would give you the spirit which will let you know truth about God and help you to understand them so that you will know him better. I want to talk to you tonight about who God is. Suppose someone walked up to you on the street and asked you, who is God? What would you tell them? And then let's just say you give them one of these uh, great definitions that we Christians sometimes tend to give, which is a quick thing off the top of our head that we've heard from somewhere else. But suppose they say, okay, then, then what is God to you? What does it mean to you? And then you give them some kind of answer for that, and then they, can tell you, then they would ask you, well, can you tell me more about this God and how I can get to know him and what he can do for me? What would you tell him then? 
See, there's a lot of questions that people could ask you that we need to be able to give the answer to. And each one of us is different. Who is God is the same answer. But what can God do for me is a different thing. What does God mean to me is a different thing than what he means to you. So we want to look at that a little bit and talk about who this God is. Now, all throughout the Bible, in the Old Testament especially, they gave God names. He had a lot of names. If you go back through one day and just, just pull it up and begin to look at all the different names from God, there are just hundreds of names they called him. They had a way back then, every name back, especially in the Old Testament, had a specific meaning. If you named your baby John, it had a specific meaning. It always had something behind it that went along with the name. And they carried this tradition right on over with God. And then when they began to name God, they began to come up with all kind of names for him that meant something. Let me give you just a few. For example, he was Elohim. And that means God, the incredible, the powerful, the mighty, the supreme. So it is God, just period. Creation is a picture of that God. When God created everything, he made all things. He spoke all things into existence. There was none here before him. There will be none after him. He is God. He is supreme. Another name they used was Yahweh. And this means the Lord, the I am, the Almighty. And we know that one he used when he was talking about Moses. And when God, Moses would talk about God, he said, I am the great I am. So he would refer to him as that. Another is Abba. This means daddy or father, someone who is loving, someone who is tender. And we see that in the Lord's Prayer, our Father, who art in heaven. And when we refer to Father there, that's Abba Father. So they gave him that name. Another is El Roi. This is God, the God who sees. That God is always looking after his people. So they would name that and they'd say, this is a God that knows everything about us. It's a God that watches over us. It's a God that feels my pain. A God that's there when I hurt or whenever I have a situation. That God is there. So he is that father who sees me everywhere that I am. The story of Hagar in the Bible, there is God is referred to in this way. He watched over her and when she was put out, And had nothing to do, God was watching over her. Society had left her, but God never had. So he was Abba to her, and he was El Roi to her. Another is El Shaddai. This means God Almighty. It means we run to him. He is God Almighty, so we can run to him. He's our shelter. He is everything that we will ever need, our assurance, our security. He's there, always there for us. In Psalms 91, this God is referred to in there. He is the shadow of the Almighty. We run to him. So Psalms 91 is all about El Shaddai. Jehovah Jireh. This means God will provide. In everything we ever need, God was always there for us. Abraham, when he went up to, to sacrifice Isaac, God provided a ram. This is when they're referring to him there as El Shaddai, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And then Jehovah Rapha. This means the healer. He is our healer. The Lord will provide. Heal. Remember when the woman with the issue of blood came to, to Jesus that day? When she came to him, the Lord will heal. The Lord has touched me, referring to this reference of God. And then Yahweh Shalom, the Lord is peace. The Lord is peace in our lives. When Gideon faced a great army and didn't know what to do, there he was referred to as this God, the God of peace. Be not afraid, Joshua. Stand still. See, they're all throughout the time of the Bible, he talked to different characters and said, Peace be unto you. Every time that God would do something great, they would name him. They would call him something. That name was more than just saying, he is God. They, they would say, he is God El Shaddai. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is El Roi. Whatever it meant to them at that time, they would apply a name to it. And then that name was listed and it said, every time you see this name refers to God, and every time we talk about God in this instant, it refers by him. So that one, one name couldn't be used for all things, but God was, the, God was the thing of every name. So as we look at that, we're going to talk about tonight 
Who, who is God to you? What, what have you named God? What, what is there in your life that stands out that you can name God for? And what would you call him today? If we could make up names, what would you name God today in your life? In all the situations you face? Well, first of all, we have to know that God always has been. There's never been a time whenever God wasn't. One day, Jesus was there talking and preaching and teaching, and he made a reference to knowing Abraham. And one of the Gentiles spoke up and said, wait a minute, you can't know Abraham because you're not even that old. He, he, he'd been dead. You, you couldn't have known him. So how do you claim to have known Abraham? And Jesus said to them, he said, listen, before Abraham ever was, I was. I've always known Abraham. I've always known everything about him because I've always been here. I created everything. I see everything. I know everything. I feel everything. You see those four things there? Those names are, are we used a while ago. Each one of those things has a name. So they would call him that. Second, God is always where he's ever needed. Whatever God needs to be, wherever he needs to be, God is there with the answer. He is everything with God. Everything is available. Everything is possible if we can look to him and trust him. During these times we're going through now, everything is possible. Anything can happen. God can do anything if we will just get to him, get inside of God, understand God, and let God speak to us so that we can say, God is my what? And name it. He is my Lord, my God, my Savior, my healer, my provider. He is my protector. Whatever God is, we have to claim it, and then we have to name it and mark it down so that we can remember it. God is everything I will ever need. Thirdly, remembering things about God always helps us to believe. When we take communion, Jesus would tell the disciples, he said, Now, take this bread, and when you take it, remember thou me. Remember. Always the word remember. He'd tell them to drink the cup. And he'd say, remember. And what are they to remember? They're to look back and to remember the things about him. Plus, they're also to look farther on in life and look back at that communion when he sat there with them. And he said, remember this moment. But also remember those moments prior to that. We need to be able to remember things about God. How do you do that? See, we name it. I was, I was out yesterday and and, and looking, looking at some, some um, hunting property with somebody, and they said, you know, we name everything. This, this, is, the, this is the Danny spot, and, and this is the Michael spot, and this is the Bill spot. We name everything so that when we say this is the Bill spot, something comes on here and says, oh, I know exactly where that is. You know, this was the honey hole. Oh, and when you're fishing, this is the honey hole. Oh, I remember. I know exactly where the honey hole is. I used to go with Mike one time and... and uh, Billy took me one time and told me about Rattlesnake and took me to a place called Rattlesnake. I thought, that's a weird name for a fishing hole. But he took me to Rattlesnake, and I've never forgotten it. I know what Rattlesnake is. It's not just a dirty old reptile. It's also a honey hole for fishing. See, we put things in our minds to help us remember things, and then when someone mentions it or when it comes back up in our mind, it helps us to believe again. We went to Rattlesnake last year, and we caught a ton of fish. Let's go back there. See, we can remember things about it. I go fishing with a guy, and every time we go around the corner, he tells me about all the fish that the people have caught there, and I get tired of hearing it. We caught so-and-so last year here, and we caught so-and-so here, and we've done this here, and he caught this one here, and he caught a 10-pounder here, and he lost a 3-pounder here. You know, you just get... And so I said, okay, let's go somewhere else because there's no more fish here. We done caught them all. See, we've got to remember. So as we think about these things with God, how do you remember him? Think about this for a moment. Now, let your minds go with you tonight, okay? Open them up, and let's do some mental gymnastics. Let's play some games. First of all, what would you think that Daniel would name God? The lion tamer. Daniel says, to me, he's the lion tamer. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say of God, they would say, well, he's the fireman. David would say of God, he is the missile man. Took that rock, shot it right up to his forehead like a missile and killed him. He's the missile man. Samson would say, oh, 
He's the hair giver. The hair giver. Abraham would say he's, as, he's the ram provider. Peter would say, oh, he is the water hardener. And Lazarus would say he's the life giver. See, so you look at those characters and something specific stands out in their mind. So we name something for them. Now we can remember. And now we can remember God in their life. What did God mean to them? In the old days, they used to give everybody a nickname. Everybody had a nickname. I took my dad with me one time to do some work, and he said, yeah, we're going over to Frog's Place. And I said, we're going where? He said, we're going to Frog's Place. And I looked at the worksheet I had. There was no frog on there anywhere whatsoever. And I said, Daddy, we're supposed to be going to so-and-so's house. He said, oh, yeah, but his name's Frog. So that's the nickname we gave him. Now, I get these ideas. Why was he Frog? Did he, did he hop around? Did he croak a lot? What was there about him that made him Frog? My daddy's nickname was Bug. If you knew my daddy, you called him Bug. If you were friends with my daddy, you'd call him Warren or WC. If you didn't know my daddy, you'd call him Mr. Callahan. See, we always had an, an idea of how people knew my dad. But if you knew him, you called him Bug. Bug. Now, how did daddy get the nickname Bug? My dad was a big man. So what kind of bug was he? What did somebody have in mind when they said, we're going to call you Bug? My nickname in college was Squirrel Dog. We used to go squirrel hunting. We'd float down the river. And every time you'd shoot one, it was my job to go up on the banks and get it. So they called me Squirrel Dog. And I earned that thing very well. And uh, it was a bad nickname, but it worked for them. So how do you get these names? There are some other nicknames that I've learned to give to my grandchildren. I can affectionately refer to them as Stink Nasty, Buzzard Guts, Gopher Nose, Hog Lips. They know exactly what I'm talking about when I say that. They know exactly which one I'm talking about when I say that. Now, which one do those names apply to? Something special has happened that makes me realize that I can say about Jackson, he's Stink Nasty. What is there? If I said about Brody, don't be around him when he takes his shoes off, you'll know exactly why he gets that name. But see, we, we, we can remember something. It makes it, see, life is easy. If we, if, we can, if we can associate a name with something, then it makes it better. It makes it easier to remember. That's how they teach and memorize things. You go and you open a book and you look on that page, you see something, and you remember something about that page that brings it back to your mind. And you can remember Dale Carnegie. Took that course. It was all about remembering something and associating it with something else. So what is God to you? When someone goes to ask you, who is God? How would you explain it to them in your everyday life? What is God to you? They they're certainly want to know what the Bible says about God. Yes. But their biggest thing is, what is God to you? What has God done for you? Tell me something real about God. Tell me something I can remember. So I began to look at some of these things, and I, I began to play with some words. What are some of the names that we would use to describe God? Suppose I said God is L. Baby Washer, Baby Watcher. Then what would God be? How many of us have ever gone in that room where our baby's burning up with a fever? And we begin to pray. And we ask God to deliver that child. He's a baby watcher. How many times have we prayed when our children go to take a trip, we say, God, protect them, go before them, behind them, above them, below them, be within that vehicle, protect them, bring them back home. He's a baby watcher. You see, so if we can think about that, we can name him. What about job finder? How many times have we been out looking for jobs, needing something desperate in our lives, and we've prayed and we've prayed and we've sought God, and now God helps us. We find a job, and someone says, who is God to you? He's a job finder in my life. I remember the time I didn't have a job, and I prayed, and God gave me a job. He's a job finder. See, every name they use in the Old Testament describes something that God was to them. Every one of us must have a personal relationship with God. And that personal relationship means that God at times does things in our lives that stand out. 
What is there about your life? What miracles have you had in your life? Real miracles. What, what, what has God done for you in a great way that you can never forget? And if that moment is asked in your mind, how in the world do you describe it to somebody else? Well, I remember the time that God did so. Yeah, but God does that for a lot of people. How can you use a name or a word to describe it that makes a difference to somebody else? You see, he's Jehovah Jireh. Uh, what is that? That's the name of God. He's Jehovah Jireh. Yeah, well, what does that mean? And then we tell them. There was a time in my life when I lacked and God provided it for me. Jehovah Jireh. The children of Israel going out in that desert, all out there, God provided for them time and time and time again. At the, you know, and what did they say? He is Jehovah Jireh. Who's been with you, Jehovah Jireh? I thought God was. Well, God is, but he's Jehovah Jireh to me. He has provided everything I've ever needed out here. See, you name those things. Help people react to them. What about, as one was saying, salvation? The greatest miracle of all is salvation. So he is the salvation giver. There was a time that God saved me. Yes, but God has saved millions of people. Yeah, but he's a salvation giver to me. It's different. It means something to me. I remember that moment. I remember that time. I remember the day. I remember where I was when God gave me salvation. I didn't earn it. He gave it to me. And you can relate that to them. And you can testify to them. And you can share with them. God is the L church finder. God, send me to a church. God, help me find the right pastor. God, help me find this. God, help me find that. Lord, send me to a church that teaches and preaches truth. God, send me to a church that I can be challenged. And God sent me to a church. And, and then you can say, well, how would you get to this church? Well, I just riding down the road one day, and I saw a sign up there. It had a funny saying on the thing. And I thought, wow, that would be a neat church to go to. I think I'll go in and try them out. No, I prayed, and I asked God, I said, Lord, where do you want me to go to church? And God gave me a church. He's the church giver. He directed me. He helped me. He, he helped me in my find to be able to find that church that I needed most for me. He's the church finder. And I tell you what, God can find you a church too. You got to be looking, though. You got to want God's will in your life, and you do. I serve church L finder. I mean, I serve L church finder. My God is always there and always there for me. My God's a waymaker. A waymaker. What do you mean by that? My God made a way for me when there was no way. I'm telling you, the doctors have given up on me. People have given up on me. I was lost. I was undone. I was a drug addict and had no hope and nobody to love for me and nobody cared for me. And one day I heard about Jesus Christ and he's a way maker. He made a way for me to live. He made a way for me to come to Calvary. He made a way for me to find an altar. He made a way for me to find a church. My God's a way maker. And I'm telling you, he's the greatest thing ever happened to me. Do you see how easy it is to testify to people when you name your God? And we talk about we don't know how to testify. God is a way maker. My God also is a tribulation barrier. See, God says we got to live in this world, but we don't have to be a part of this world. Everything the world's going through tonight, today, you and I can say, my God is here for me. My God has a barrier between me and the things of this world. The Bible says he puts a hedge around us. He had a hedge around Job. That hedge is there to protect God's people. And only by God allowing that thing to be open can we get into trouble unless you and I decide to open that door from the inside and step out on our own and get out into the world and there's trouble. But I'd rather hide behind that barrier of God knowing that God will keep me safe from every storm that ever comes across to my life. Do I still have to get in trouble at times? Do I still face these storms? Yes, but not a one has ever taken me down. Not a one's ever destroyed me. Not a one's ever sent me to hell because my God has protected me and given me a way in my life and everything he has ever done. My God is a heaven promiser. A heaven promiser. My God tells me that he loves me, that he died for me, and if I confess my sins and turn my life over him, he'll forgive me, and, and, I, and he will always watch after me and keep me and protect me. And one day, he's prepared a home for me, and one day, 
I can claim that home. That place is called heaven. It's not like anything on this earth. This earth is full of trouble and trials and tribulations and bad things and ugly things and mean things and mean people. But in heaven, there's nothing but good. One day I'm not going to have any more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more tears. One day I'm going to see Jesus face to face. One day I won't live by faith, I'll live by sight because my God has promised me a home in heaven. You see, that's the kind of God I serve. Do you know him? What does God mean to you? It's time that God's people begin to be active and creative in their minds to help other people see what we feel and what we know about our God. My God is a smile giver. He just helps me to laugh. The preacher gets up and gets tongue-tied, and I laugh at him. He's a smile maker. When things aren't going good, God shares, I can smile. He shares something, I hear it, I see it, I smile. God has put people in the church, and I walk in, and I just laugh at them. Not because of their faith. Either. Of course, there's some of those in there too, but I smile. They make me smile. See, I thank God because he's put a smile on my face. The Bible says that Jesus laughed. More than one time in the Bible it says Jesus laughed. Now, if my God can laugh, that means he wants us to laugh. He wants us to be happy. And there are people that God's put in my life that make me smile. And I thank God for those people. I thank God that they're full of joy, they're full of love, and they give it to me. And I want to be a smile maker. I want to help other people smile too. I want other people to know it is fun serving Jesus Christ. It's a real smile. It comes from within my heart. It's created by God, and it's a good thing. So I thank God because he's a smile maker in my life. My God is a joy maker. A joy maker. That's what I'll call him, El Joy Maker. Because I'm living such sad times. You look around you, there is nothing but bad on the news. There is nothing but sad on the news. It's one bad thing after another, after another, after another, and it gets worse and worse and worse. And there is no joy in Mudville because Monty Casey has struck out. Well, mighty Casey, you cannot strike out as long as there's a God living on this earth. As long as we trust God, we will never strike out as a Christian. We'll never strike out and go down. I don't care what's going on. I don't care the circumstance. I don't care the situation. My God will always be there to give me the joy. And why is that? Because the joy of the Lord is my strength. And Jesus said, I give you my joy. Not the joy that the world knows, but my joy, and my joy is everlasting. The joy of the world is a joke. And after you've laughed enough, it's no longer funny. God gives us something that is permanent, that is ever-flowing, and is always there, the joy of the Lord. My God, this one, this, my God is a live streamer. L, live streamer. When the devil is going to cut Christianity out. When the devil is going to shut our churches down. When the devil says, I'll shut the preacher's mouths up, I'll stop them from carrying the word out, I can make sure that they no longer can tell the story of Jesus Christ, my God is a live streamer. Because my God enabled us to, pre to, to be able to broadcast live. People didn't have to be in the audience. They could sit at home, watch it. They can sit in their cars and hear it. They can gather in a parking lot and not get out of their cars if they don't want to. They can hear, they can see the story of Jesus Christ because my God found a way to get it out there over and above the devil. The gospel is reaching more people today than it ever has before because we're taking it outside the church. Isn't that a beautiful thing? You see, what the devil's trying to make for bad, God is using it for good. So this message is going out all over the place. The dirty, nasty, filthy Facebook has actually turned into something good because God is being broadcast on Facebook. Who knows? He may clean that whole thing up. It'll be a good thing for us over with. But until then, God can use bad things to make good things out of them. It's going everywhere. Thank God that now Instagram, that Facebook, and all these other media things, live stream, TV, whatever, Jesus Christ is being proclaimed in ways that he never has been proclaimed before. Blessed be the name of Jesus Christ. You'll look back on this years from now and say, what would you do when they shut God down? Live stream, because I had a God whose name was live stream. You see, 
bless God. My God is a mess deliverer. You ever been in a mess? Who got you out? My own wisdom got me out of it. Your own wisdom got you in it. So your own wisdom ain't going to get you out of it. God, I cried unto God. David says it many times. I poured myself out of God. I fell before God's feet. I gave him everything and said, God, I've made a total mess out of everything. Will you clean it up? He said, yeah. And I want you to know today, every one of you is looking. My God is a mess cleaner upper. He will clean up any mess that you'll give to him. And I don't care what you're doing. I don't care what's going on in your life. I don't care what habits you got. I don't care how bad you think you are. My God can clean you up. He has something stronger than bleach, something that will last forever, something that will make you happy while he's doing it and after he's done it. It is a disinfectant of the devil, and he'll get him out of your life. Amen. He's a mess cleaner upper. My God is a shortage provider. Always been there. Always provided. I lack $14 having 27 cents. God gave me $15. God has always been there. God has always met the needs in my life. And I'm going to tell you something. Because God has always been that person for me, I want to be that person for God. I want to make sure I reach the needs of other people. What's the greatest need in the world today? Jesus Christ. Not a cure for this virus. Jesus Christ. Because you can get a cure for this virus and die and still go to hell. But you get Jesus Christ in your heart, and no matter whether you live or die, you can go to heaven. So the greatest need today is Jesus Christ. We need to live, love it. We need to share it. And our God will provide that, and I want to be one to help him provide that to the world. And I challenge every single one of you, make the same statement. God used me to provide Jesus Christ to this world who is lost and does not know where they're going, does not know what tomorrow holds, but we do. God used me to be that person from this day forward. Very quickly, some that we certainly recognize. God is a deer slayer. His name is fish catcher. His name is cake baker. His name is deal maker. We could go on and on and on and on about who God is. When Moses was told to go to Pharaoh, he said, who in the world can I say sent me? He said, just tell him the great I am, who is the great I am, sent you. What is God to you today? That statement has always been one that's intriguing. Because I say, what does it mean? The great I am, who I am, sent you. God is whatever we may need in our lives. The great I am. Every one of those things I called out, that's God. He is that to us. And he's more. Whatever we can allow God to be in our life, he will be. Just think for a moment. How would you describe God in your life? How would you tell somebody else who Jesus is to you? What is he? Who is he? What name would you give them to make them think, oh, and every time they hear that name, they will remember God. I challenge you. Because today in this world that we're living in, we must know that the great I am who is the great I am, can do anything, can provide anything, can be anywhere, can say whatever is necessary, can meet every need, can heal, can protect, provide. Our God is everything we could ever need if we can only accept it and then give it to somebody else. What a great God we have. Do you know him today? Do you know who he is? Is all well with your soul? If all's well with your soul, it's because you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, then he is your father, your friend, and he takes care of his friends. Tonight, I encourage you, love the Lord. Share who he is. Name him in your life and let people see Christ in the way that you live. Today, the world needs to hear and see something. More desperate than they ever have before is the moment now we can give it to them. Father, you're an awesome, loving God. You've been so much to every one of us. 
That's why we're in this building tonight. That's why we're watching live. Because you mean so much to us, God. You've done so much. You gave, forgave us of our sins. You set us free. You give us your grace. You give us your mercy. You give us your love. God, you do everything we ever need if we, like babes, just trust you. Just come to you like children and walk after you, serve you, and love you. God, tonight I pray through in the midst of this storm that you'll continue to watch over your people. And that God will be able to say, my God is able. And that we will stand upon you, trusting in you, knowing, God, that all is going to be well because you're going to hold our hands. You're holding it now. You're going to hold it tomorrow. You're going to be with us. You're going to be everything we'll ever need. But, God, can we also be creative and name you in such a way that other people can see you in a way that they haven't before? Can we use your name, God, as a means of testimony to tell other people about the greatness and the goodness of God? Will we have boldness enough to give back to you what you have given to us? God, I thank you for those who are alive and well that trust you. I thank you for those, God, who are going to step up and do the right thing. I thank you, God, because you're still the God of America. I believe that with all my heart. And you said if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, God, turn and seek you, then, then, God, you will heal this land. So let us be that kind of people. Let us help other people to see that's what America needs to do is turn back to you and that, God, we will lead them. Lead them in that quest. We will lead them and show them the way. Thank you for it. Keep us, bring us back to your house. Let us study your word. Let us keep together in everything we do. And we tell you we love you and we praise you. Amen.